Norwood Fowler, United States Army, Korea. I interviewed Norwood Fowler in Spartanburg, South Carolina, March 17, 2006. He's part of my film, Korea, The Forgotten War. He served with the 65th Infantry Regiment, which was a Puerto Rican outfit during Korea, 3rd Division. Norwood was also a licensed minister. His story is one of the most profound that I've ever recorded over the years. He enlisted in the United States Army at the age of 12. Unbelievable. He said he was 19. He was big for his age and he got into war 13 years of age in combat. He was a drill instructor at the age of 15. He lost a lot of friends at that young age. If you can imagine being 13 years old in combat, that's something my mind can't even imagine. But he has a tremendous story. He died at the age of 72 and I miss him dearly. And I'd like to thank Brandon Glidden for helping make this story possible. Brandon, again, a great big thank you to you, sir, for your passion, dedication, commitment to telling these stories. And thank you for partnering with me and helping me to preserve the legacy of these veterans for our, our younger generation as well as our older generation and bring into light what happened during the Korean War. We lost uh, almost as many people in three years in Korea as we lost in 10 years in Vietnam. So I invite you to sit back and listen to this story. It's my great honor and pleasure to bring you this story. And if you're watching these videos, I encourage you to please consider becoming a sponsor yourself like Brandon. Sponsor one of these stories. I have many of them. I've recorded all these over the years. Now I'm trying to bring the entire interviews that I did with these veterans. And I want you to feel like me on the other end of that camera, getting the personal side of war. And I, I just encourage you to please um, to consider doing that. There's information in the video description. You can contact me on my website, LarryCapato.com. Okay, I'm going to bring you Norwood's story now, the complete interview I did with him over 15 years ago. God bless you for watching. Please share these stories, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Here, with you it's different starting because mm -hmm. of your age but I'm just going to ask the same questions and then Correct. We'll, we'll probably no talk problem. about no problem. some of the age thing but uh, I, first thing I want to know is about you you joining the army and, and, and then finding yourself in Korea just give me the give mm -hmm. me kind of a short mm -hmm. version of that right. about what year that was and if you want to mention mm -hmm. your age go ahead okay go ahead uh, I enlisted in the military in 1952 uh, volunteer for the draft. Uh, I put my age up to 19 and when I received a registration card I went to the local board and uh, told them I wanted to uh, volunteer for the draft. Well they said they need three more vacancies. They had three more vacancies and they wanted to fulfill them and uh, I told them I wanted to be one of them so I enlisted as a draft team. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for 16 weeks of infantry basic training. And after my 16 weeks of basic training, I was on orders to the Far East Command, which is Korea. Uh, I went to Korea. I stopped in Seoul, Korea. Actually, I landed in Incheon. And then I went to Seoul, and from Seoul, I went straight to the front line. I was in the 65th Infantry Regiment, and the 65th Infantry Regiment was a uh, Puerto Rican outfit. And they had tried to take a hill in Korea called Papasan for two weeks. Papasan is so high that the top of it is up in the clouds. You can't see the top. And uh, most of the unit got wiped out. And the ones that didn't get wiped out, they refused to go back and try to take Papasan. So they kind of disbanded the 65th Infantry Regiment and they sent fresh GIs from the United States into that particular outfit, the 65th Infantry Regiment of 3rd Division. And I was one of them, straight out of basic training. And they assigned me to a uh, machine gun platoon. And uh, I was very afraid because I was only 13 years old. In about a week, I was a 
combat veteran because I had seen a lot of my friends that I was in basic training with die and I had to uh, help put them in body bags and different things like that. So I became mature very quickly. And uh, I stayed in Korea for 15 months. And uh, after I left Korea, uh, I come back to the States. I was a platoon sergeant at uh, Fort Jackson. In other words, I was given basic training to recruits. And I was only, uh, I think, 14 and a half or 15 years old at that particular time. And then after then, I, I only had two years. So I got out and I stayed out 30 days and I re-enlisted. And I went in the 82nd Airborne and took my paratrooper training, which I have uh, a paratrooper badge. And I have a CIB badge, which is called a Combat Entry Badge. And I'm the youngest person that received the Combat Entry Badge. I was. I received it at the age of 13 years old. You know, uh, I, I got to stop you. Mm. This, this, that age, it just, I, I can't even imagine. You know, personally, I, I don't think I, I could have been mentally ready at 19, 20, 21, and here you are at 12. What mm. motivated you to go in at that early age and then find yourself in combat? How did you deal with that? Well, uh, I was in the seventh grade, and I was 12 years old, and uh, I come from a kind of a bad background. Uh, my father drank a lot and my mother drank a lot and I didn't have accurate clothes to go to school and I was kind of ashamed to wear the clothes I had to go to shoes, school because I only had two pair of pants. In the evening time I washed one pair and, and uh, I tried to iron them dry and run the pockets and things would be still wet. <laughs> but I still will put those clothes on to go to school. And uh, I, I just matured at an early age. Uh, the area that I was raised up in, it was a poor neighborhood, and my mother was an alcoholic. And the particular day that uh, I told her I was going into the military, she was uh, recovering from a hangover. And I told her I was going into the army, and she said, boy, you better get out of here and go on to school. So instead of going to school, I went to the draft boat, and that's what I enlisted and went in the army. Well, at that particular time, that's when they had segregation, and and, and blacks were still uh, up on the boundaries and stipulations and things like this. And so my father, he went to the Red Cross to tell him that I was on the age and he wanted me to get out. And uh, the officials at the Red Cross told him that uh, they would follow up on it, but they didn't. And uh, so I stayed on in the military and they didn't follow up on it. And I, I went in the military because of hardships. And when I went in the military, when I found out that you eat three meals a, a day, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> because I used to eat cornflakes without milk. Uh, I put, put some cold water on there and eat those cornflakes, and a lot of times I didn't have anything to eat. And so when I went in the military, it was just like hell. You know, three meals a day and, and the running and the exercise, it didn't bother me because I was 12 years old and I was used to that. Because I lived uh, probably about three or four miles from uh, the closest movie. The movie was uptown, I live across town. But see, when I go to the movie, me and my friends, my friends and I, we get together and we are roaring from across town all the way to the movie. So when I went in the military, that was easy for me. And uh, the other hardships and things, which we call hardships in the military, were easy. It was a gravy train to me. I enjoyed it. And so a lot of my uh, counter friends, which was 20 and 25 years old in the military, uh, on marches and running and exercises, they fall out, and uh, it was a play thing for me, and I be I basically enjoyed it. And uh, even when I went to when I went to Korea, I was very afraid because <clears throat> I was even afraid on the ship. Um, when we got to Incheon, Korea, and I was on the ship, I could see that. The planes up in the air, they were dog fighting. Although they were about 20, 30 miles away, you can see easily they were dog fighting up there. So I, I became very afraid. And uh, I urinated on myself. <laughs> I was so afraid. But uh, we stood at about two hours, and then it was time for us to crawl over the side of the ship off the rope into the LSTs with the, my weapon and my bags and all the different things. So I clammed over there, over the side of the ship and got on the LST and the LST carried us to uh, the landing port and after we got to the landing port we got on some trains and uh, the train that we got on didn't have no windows in it. You couldn't smoke anything, which I didn't smoke at the time, no way. 
and never had even kissed a girl. <laughs> and uh, the reason you couldn't light up no cigarette because of the intimate, see that fire from the cigarette, they were found on the, on the, plane, on the train. So we got to, uh, on the way to Incheon, I mean in Seoul, Korea, it started snowing. And uh, the flakes of snow were some of the biggest flakes I ever seen in my life. They were as big as a baseball. And you couldn't hardly see if they'd be coming out in such flurries. So uh, we got to Seoul, and I got afraid again, very, very afraid, because they had a line of ambulance that looked like it was a, a mile long. And each, and each one of those ambulances, they had four different stretches in them. And those are the ones that had got wounded at the front line, and they were bringing them back to get on the medical ship and go back to the States. And uh, I did get afraid. I said, as soon as I get to uh, anybody with authority, I'm going to tell them how old I am. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so uh, we finally, when we got to Seoul, uh, they put us on uh, some trucks and sent us up to a receiving company. And I seen a sergeant. And uh, I told the sergeant I wanted to talk to him. And uh, I started to tell him how old I was. And he told me, he said, boy, you better get on that truck and get away from here. So I didn't have time to tell him that I was only uh, 13 years old. So I got on the truck and I went to the front line. And once I got to the front line, uh, I was surrounded by my friends I took basic training with, and I was, I, I was kind of skeptical of telling anybody how old I was in front of them because I wanted to be mature. And I, I, I didn't never tell it. And so I just went on through uh, mature. And, well, tell and, me about a little bit of the first times that you were in combat in the story that I read, and they said you were calling for your mom or you wanted your mother. It, it, and, and just tell me that story and then the baptism under fire. That's yes, the okay. Uh, the first time up on the fire, uh, I, I, I kind of froze up because I never, never dreamed I'd be shooting anyone or killing anyone. And so I froze up and I couldn't find my weapon. And uh, they were getting close and close because in Korea, they are uh, attacking waves. So I knew that if I didn't do something, I'm gonna let my friends down and also I'm gonna get killed. So I start firing. And after uh, a, a few rounds uh, of firing my weapon, and, and it's, it's kind of like a, uh, you get into a, a different mood, you be a different person. And uh, it was either you fire and survive. And I, that's what I did. And then it became a reality, you know, it, everything just become natural. And so it was an instinct that, I, that came over me and I, I continued to do it. And I, once I started getting into it, uh, I became a combat veteran. It didn't take no week or no two weeks. It just took a few uh, rounds popping around your head and, and seeing somebody beside you kill over dead. And this person was talking to you a few minutes ago, now they did. So that's what, that's what took, made me uh, get into uh, the combat. And that's what made me get into uh, uh, the camp combat reality. Now, yeah, I cried. I cried a many nights uh, for my mother because I didn't let nobody see me cry, but I cried because I was, this first time I ever been away from home and I was uh, young and I, was, I wasn't, uh, uh, I, could, I wasn't adapted to no military life or somebody shooting a, a weapon at me. And, and eight uh, rifles and uh, motor shells and artillery shells falling all around me, and I just wasn't used to it. And but when I got over that, it took me about three days. But when I got over that, I was a seasoned combat veteran, just like anybody else. See, well, sometimes you can put a person in an adverse situation, and they can uh, they adapt. They adapt to the situation. They can be 12 years old or 20 years old. They have to adapt. The body is made up where it will adapt. And so that's what I did. I adapted to the combat situation, and I became a combat soldier in about three days. Um, I remember one time I was on a hole. You know, we call it a sump. You know, where you throw the garbage at over in. And uh, the artillery shells came in, and I jumped over in that sump. And uh, I stayed there about three or four hours. And it seemed to me like my mother was standing over that sump. And she told me, say, everything gonna be all right. And which it was, everything began to be all right. But uh, I seen the many of my friends I took basic training with uh, get killed. And I seen one of them was a particular friend of mine, his name was Davis, from Columbia, South Carolina. A person, that, a good person. 
Uh, he used to write home every day and didn't drink, didn't smoke. Just a good, very good person. And uh, David was in the 76 were called his rifle platoon. And I was in a machine platoon. Uh, the 76 were called rifles was probably uh, uh, 300 meters away from where I was in the machine gun platoon. And the next day, uh, I went up to visit David's, where his location was, where his, his gun emplacement was. And they told me, well, they actually looked at me kind of funny at first. His platoon did. And then uh, they told me, say, didn't you know that David got killed last night? Now, what you mean he got killed? He said a round came in and uh, blowed his head off. And that thing hurt me so bad, you know. And uh, those things like that would make you, I got angry for one thing. And, and by me getting angry, it made me want to go out and kill and do more. And, uh, uh, and all through my tour over there, I went through certain situations at the same thing. I had a young lieutenant named Lieutenant Kelly. Uh, we were trying to take a hill, it was a hill 555, next to Old Bali in Korea. And uh, it was a daylight raid. And uh, I couldn't understand why we were going to try to uh, take a hill in the daytime, and they could see us coming. But later on, I found out that the general wanted to test our outfit out and test the strength of the enemy. And so he sent our company up here, 555. Well, in the battle of 555, we was going up the hill, and Lieutenant Kelly uh, got wounded. But they, the medic picked him up to carry him back down the hill, and he was saying, I need to get back with my men. So he jumped off the stretcher, and he went back up the hill to guide his men, and that's the last that uh, I seen or heard of him because he got killed up on 555. And that's why, that's five, here 555 is where I received my uh, two bronze stars. Tell me the citation, what you did to receive those bronze stars. Well, I, I kept fighting, I kept using my machine gun, and I kept on using it to uh, ward off the enemy that were coming because they were attacking in waves. Some of them had sticks, some of them blowing bugles, and it was coming in instead of waves. And instead of me uh, panicking or uh, running back down the hill and thing, I just continued to stay there and uh, fire a machine gun to wave off the attack. And that actually saved a lot of my other uh, friends from getting killed by me staying there and not panicking and staying right there with the machine gun instead of firing. But by me firing that machine gun and staying there, it wasn't something that I was so heroic. It was just that I was a different person. Uh, you get into a different state of mind. And it's a state of mind that uh, most of any combat veteran can tell you about it, but they don't understand. It's just something that happened. Uh, when bullets fly out, flying out of Ryan and people screaming for mama, you know, the average person, when they in combat and they get hit, the first thing they holler is mama. And although mama's 8,000, 9,000 miles away, and uh, you hear the screaming, it's hollering, and then you're, you're dribbling, and you're going through certain situations and certain states of mind, and it puts you in a different state of mind. The average person that uh, do something heroic, they don't remember basically what they were doing when they were doing it. And I didn't either. The only thing I know, I better, I better keep my finger on that machine going and fire fire. And I better fire it the way that I was taught in basic training because I know if that, that barrel get too hot, then they're going to be the end of that machine going and I couldn't fire no more. So I, I, I remember my, my training in basic training. You fire at least six bursts. And then you fire a couple more, and you let it rest, and you rest, fire some more. And that's what I did. Well trained. <laughs> I, I still am amazed by how young you were and, and your mentality and your maturity that allowed you to do that. Um, it just, what are, you, what are you thinking about after? I mean, you, in your article, it mentioned you saw the, the Chinese falling. Yes. And at first, it probably was... And then it became almost routine. This is war. This is what I do. I mean, are you conscious of fighting for God and country in Korea, or is it a matter of survival when you're over there? Well, at my age, in a, in a, the, the, in the area where I was raised up at, I didn't know anything about God and country. I, I didn't know what the word mean by God and country. I remember by God because uh, I used to go to Sunday school. And I know about God, but I didn't know anything about God and countries. In basic training, they were teaching us about fighting communism. I didn't know what the word communism meant. And the other thing that I was doing then was fighting for survival. I was fighting for survival, and also I was retaliating against 
the, the ones I had went through basic training with, and those people who were getting killed, uh, retaliating, and also fighting for survival. And basically, survival. I didn't know anything about communism. I didn't know anything about uh, the word that we were using God and country at that particular time. But I understand now. Were you able to help any of your friends that were shot or wounded or killed? I mean, were you able to be around them and help them and talk to them or anything like that? Do you remember? Uh, definitely not. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't have no time to once they were wounded. The only thing I do is call for the medic and say, medic, uh, got a wound over here. Uh, I didn't have time to talk to them. And I had time to talk to uh, some of them that was wounded later on after the action is all over. It might last for uh, 30 minutes, it might last for an hour, it might, might ask for, last for maybe several hours. But then uh, that particular person is wounded, probably won't be no further back than the, the, the first aid station before they be evacuated further. So you have time to go back and uh, talk to some of them. And uh, the only thing you can do then is comfort them and, and, and tell them they're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. did, you and, have, did you have any communication with home uh, in Korea? Did you write letters to your family or did they contact you? I, I used to write letters to my mother. And uh, I didn't want my mother to write me that much because when she write me and I receive a letter, it, uh, it, it kind of bothered me because she stayed sick a lot because it's like I told you, she was an alcoholic. And she stayed sick a lot, and I'd rather not even hear from her that she'd been into the hospital or that she'd gone through some type of illness or something like that, because I had too much in my mind just trying to uh, survive and, and, and take care of myself. And uh, I, like a lot of soldiers, they want to receive mail from home. I, I didn't want to receive too much mail from home. I was right, and I was telling her, no, she didn't have to write me back. Most of the time, it takes some time, uh, three or four weeks or a month, before I received the mail anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the camaraderie you had with the other soldiers. Great. Basic training, uh, they called me uh, a little Abner and Peanut because I, my, my suit, shoe shot size was about like a nine, but uh, they gave me a size 12 boot when I went to basic training. So I was a very, very small frame and had those big old feet. And they just called me Peanut and Little Abner. But I always kept on jokes with my friends and, and they uh, kind of, they took a liking to me. And, and uh, I know, remember one time while I was in basic training, uh, the lieutenant gave me a, a, a left face and I did a right face. And then he told me, say, uh, Peanut, do you know your left and your right? And I said, yes, sir. He said, do you know what hand you uh, wipe your behind with? And I said, yes, sir. He said, which one? I said, my right, sir. He said, well, you know, that's amazing. I use toilet paper. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's how I went through base training. But a lot of people took a lack of time. And the same lieutenant that I'm talking about was in basic training, that same lieutenant, Kelly, that I met over in Korea, the same one that went up the hill. Then we got to Korea, they used to call me lightning because I could run so fast. And one of the times, they, the reason they started calling me lightning, I was at an outhouse. And uh, everybody in the military know what an outhouse is, where you go back there and you, you take your, your little dump. And uh, I heard some, they start shelling us, some, some rounds come in. So I heard this, I, I actually could, I could have heard a wobbling sound it sounded like a motor round, and I jumped up and ran back to the bunker, and the, the round landed, but it was a dud. It didn't go off. But if it had went off, that would have been me in that house, and they started calling me Lightning. Mm -hmm. So the lieutenant told me, say, uh, Lightning, say, now, if we start being uh, attacked again, what I want you to do, I want you to take and get up on the bunker, and you start, start throwing the hand grenades, and because they wouldn't see because I was kind of dark complexion. And that's the kind of you know, friendship we had. The lieutenant told me that was a white lieutenant, and I'm black, but we was brothers. It wasn't no such thing as no black. It wasn't no such thing as no black, white. We had the same spoons. We had the same, some, drank the water out the same canteen. We were friends. We slept together in bunkers. We slept together in foxholes. We slept together in trenches, and we were friends. Black, white, Puerto Rican, 
Indians, my best friend was an Indian, all were friends. When you're up on the combat and you're up on the ad adverse circumstances, we have a tendency to the, the men in to join together. And we was friends, we were brothers, we were family. That's close. Very close. Yeah. Close, close. Mm -hmm. Smoked off the same cigarette. I started smoking while I was over there. <laughs> I started drinking over there. <laughs> I started doing the things that other people were doing because I didn't want them to think that I was uh, too young. And I, I just mended in. I started mending in. And uh, even uh, on R&R. &R. I just stayed over there for about six months and sent you on R&R &R to Japan. Mm -hmm. I never had kissed a girl. Didn't know anything about, about any sex. So uh, my friends were coming back from R&R &R and they were telling about how they spent the eight days over there and they were drinking and they had the, the girls and, and the, they're having sex and all this, this stuff. And uh, I said, I'm going on R&R, I'm going to get me some candy balls, I'm just going to have me a good time. So I had been on the front line, I think, about five months. And uh, they had stopped shelling us and we was in a bunker. And uh, I got a little bit of sleep. And in, in, in my sleep, I had a wet dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a wet dream, and I didn't know what was going on, but I, I knew it wasn't natural. <laughs> and I said, wait till I get your pants, I'm gonna try some things. So um, my time come up for me to go to R&R &R to Japan, and I went to Kokura, Japan. And when I got there, uh, we went to, a, all of us went to a, a motel. And it was a guy named Jack. They called him Jack. He gave him an American name, Jack. And uh, he took us over to the next door to this uh, two-story house. And he rung a bell. And uh, when he rung his bell, about 45 girls come out, young, nice-looking Japanese girls come out. And he told me to uh, pick me one out. And I told him, I said, no, you pick me out one. So uh, he picked me out one. I think she was about 19 years old. And I was, I think I was 14 and a half, something like that then. And uh, so I was kind of hesitant. And so she come up and she grabbed me by the hand and she carried me next door to the motel. And uh, her name was Junko. They called her Junko. So uh, we went on into the room. They gave us a room up front because I looked so young. They just called me, they started calling me Baby Son then. Baby Son. And we uh, went into the room and, and she told me to, uh, Let's get in the bed. And I told her, no, that I'd rather sit up and talk a while because I had, had a long trip. I'd been on the plane and the fly over there. And, and, and uh, let's, let's just talk. So we started talking a while, talking. So she kept on hesitating about getting in the bed. And I got into the bed. And that's when I lost my cherry. Uh, and that was my first time, my first experience. At 14 and a half years old. And then after then, I w we went out into the lobby. But before we went out to the lobby, I had another experience. Uh, she said, let's go catch a uh, shower, uh, bathing. And uh, I said, okay. So she gave me my little rubber shoes and my little kimono and stuff. And I started down the hall to the bath. And uh, she was following me. And I said, where are you going? She said, me give you bathing. I said, no, no. <laughs> she said, I'm, uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I went on in there, and I sit on this little stool, and uh, it had another tub over there, boiling hot water. So she washed me all down, and then uh, she took this hot water, and she wrenched me off, and then she told me to get over into the tub, and that, the water is very, very hot. And then we got over in the tub, and uh, uh, we soaked. Then after then, we got up, put our clothes on, went out into the lobby. That's where all my friends was, out there with their uh, girlfriends. And uh, they were drinking. I could drink I could down my wine and beer and stuff. And uh, so they told me to uh, try it, and I tried it. And that's when I started drinking. But I, I, I didn't never liked. I didn't like the taste of it. But I did what they were doing. And, and I, I, I guess I was a full pledge. I was full pledge a soldier then, wasn't I? <laughs> back back to, to combat in Korea. Mm. I mean. Describe combat to me. I mean, what, what, what's the sound of combat and, and what, what, what does this define combat to me? Combat, it, it different I went through different stages of combat. Like now, uh, the smell 
it's a smell. It's a, the smell of combat. It, it, it's a smell of death. It's a smell of a uh, 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 gunpowder. It's a smell of alcohol. Uh, the helicopters and things. Once they uh, carry the wounded and the dead, they wash the helicopter out with green alcohol. When I smell green alcohol now, I have a flashback of death, a, a wound, and blood, and evacuation. Uh, when I smell uh, gunpowder now, uh, like sometimes when the children and the people uh, shooting firecrackers, and I smell gunpowder, uh, uh, it reminds me of combat. Uh, when I hear uh, loud noises, the bang, the artillery, uh, the mortar shells, uh, you yeah, have a flashback of combat. Uh, I'm always on alert. Uh, I can't stand for a person to uh, just walk up on me and uh, uh, wake me up. And I'm always, uh, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I always wake up because the psychiatrist told me that uh, when I was in combat, I was always on alert and I'd never be just fully asleep. I have a lot of time I have just taken laid up against the back of a foxhole and nodded and got sleep. Because, so you can't say that, okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock now and uh, I'm going to bed and we're going to start back to fighting tomorrow. You can't do that. It's a continuous thing. It's no Sunday, it's no holiday, it's no day and it's no night. There's no rain and there's no snow. Uh, combat is combat. Uh, it's, it's a continuous thing, day in and day out, minute after minute. And each minute, you know that could be the minute when you might get killed. So you have to always be on alert. And so you uh, program that way. And, and, and there's no way that you can be deprogrammed. Now, a lot of times they say that you can come back home and and the psychiatrist talk to you and they deprogram you. We program people to kill. When you go into basic training, uh, they make you do so many push-ups. And like when I was in the airborne, they say, you do 50 push-ups, say, give me 10 more for airborne. And uh, you can kill, uh, you can beat five civilians. You can, you airborne, you, you infantry, you so and so and so, and they drive us in your head. Even when you're taking bayonet training, they, they teach you to haul out, kill, kill, kill. And, and, and you, this is programmed into you. And then when you actually go into combat, that is programmed into you. And, and then you can never be deprogrammed. I don't care what nobody say, you can never be deprogrammed from combat. Combat is the stuff of things that were gonna stay with you for life. I am, my regular age is 67 years old now, and I'm still living the life of when I was 13 years old when I was in combat, and I live it every day. It's something that you never, unless you lose your mind, <laughs> you never get out of it. It's something that already is programmed. And uh, when people tell you about, ask you about combat, like you did a few minutes ago, you asked me about combat. It's something that basically you can try to explain it, but you can't explain it. Because the only way you can explain combat is that you actually involved. You actually have to be involved in the situation. Uh, and then you still can't fully explain it because it happened so quick. It seemed like it's a, 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 a dream, it's something different. You're in a different state of mind. Tell me about the cold. Did it get cold in Korea where you were at? Very cold. Tell me how that affected you and where you were and, and how that affected the combat. Very right? cold. Oh, we had what we call Mickey Mouse boots. And they're supposed to keep your, your feet basically warm. And we had parkas. But I remember one day uh, I jumped off the back of a, a deuce and a half truck. Uh, this is when we first went to the front line. It was so cold that when I jumped off the back of the truck, and I landed, I didn't have no feeling in my legs or my feet. That's how cold they were. And uh, now, my big toenails comes off. They just all the make falls off. And a lot of my, a lot of people over there receive what they call trench foot, where their toes just break off. Uh, but mine didn't get that severely, but my toenails comes off, and uh, also I have problems with my back, by carrying all that hairy equipment while I was over there, my pack and, and, Ralph and 
part of the machine gun, all these different things. So I got to have arthritis in the back of my back. And I'm having problems with that. So I can't cut my toenails like they're supposed to. So every two months I have to go to the doctor where he uh, will cut my intruding toenails and, and tend to my feet. And also, in the, you, have, you have different seasons over You have the cold season, where it gets so cold, you know, unreasonable cold. Then you have the hot season, where it gets hot. And then you have the rainy season. And then the, the, main, the main thing I don't like about Korea is the hills. You go up one hill, you have to go up one hill to get to another hill. Then you go down a hill to get to another, go, go up another hill. So there's nothing but hill, hill, hills in Korea. And those, uh, the people's are, the live there, they're accustomed to it. But me, here I am, a South Carolina boy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not used to a whole lot of hills, up and down no hills, especially with all that equipment on your back. Because when you're fighting in combat, you had to carry your, your equipment with you. How did you feel, uh, I mean, seeing your friends being killed and wounded, did it scare you or did it just make you madder against the Chinese? Or how did you feel when that happened? Actually, when it first happened, it, it, it made, I was I was in, I was feared, but then again it made me mad. Uh, I remember one time we went on a patrol, and uh, on the patrol we uh, encountered the enemy, and I, I I raised my rifle up to shoot, and uh, something told me to hesitate, and I hesitated for a minute. And the reason I hesitated because it looked like it was a woman. And uh, I say, if it's a woman or not a woman, that's the enemy because she got a weapon. And so I fired, and I killed her. And it, when we checked out, it was a woman. That, that, that thing bothered me a long time. But then again, uh, we have to look at the possibility that if she was going to kill me, or I had to kill her, or she was going to kill one of my friends. Uh, I come in contact with her. Uh, all kind, of, all types of different women's children, and all kind of things. When you're in combat, combat is combat. Mm -hmm. uh, you're fighting the Chinese. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you get up close to the Chinese, or was it always at a distance? Or no, on um, like on patrol in different places like that, and ambushes and stuff like that, you get very, very close, 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 closest sometimes as you and I, uh, even close enough sometimes to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, so you get very, very close. It all depends on the situation. I was in the infantry, and that's what the infantry do. The infantry don't fight far, far back. Uh, they engage, and that's what we did. We did what we had to do. Uh, we fought out of hutches. We fought out of holes. And at some time, uh, just before the end of the war, my outfit was at a location called Old Bowling. I was at Old Bowling, we wanted to call it Jane Russell, mm -hmm. and really they call it Jane Russell because uh, it, it made like a, a big old tit. <laughs> and also, also, I was at Pork Chop Hill. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Pork Chop Hill, what, what it was, why it was called that. And it, what it was called Pork Chop Hills because it, was, it, it looked like a pork chop. And we named the hills by something, it, it, it relate to something. Like Pork Chop Hill, it made like a pork chop. Jane Russell. It, hit, it made like a, a large titty, and so we called it Jane Russell. Uh, then we had Old Bowley because it, so much artillery had hit it because there wasn't no vegetation on it, so we called it Old Bowley. And Papasan, we called Papasan because it was the highest hill in Korea. The top of it was up in the clouds, so it was Papasan. We called it Papasan because it was the largest of all the hills. And most of the hills now, most of the hills and the valleys and different places the Americans gave them name. At Pot Chop Hill, we didn't actually have to uh, take Pot Chop's Hill, but we had to defend it and hold it. Uh, I, was a, a, I was in that third division. We had the third division, the second division, the Belgians, and the Turks. And we defended Pot Chop Hill because our counterparts had already taken it before we, uh, before we got there. Uh, Old Bali, now, Old Bali was another hill that uh, we had to defend, and, and we didn't have to actually take that particular hill, but we had to defend it. And we had to defend it mostly uh, every three or four days because the enemy were trying to uh, gain territory. And uh, that's what we'll do. We'll take the, they'll try to take the hill from us, and 
If they succeed, we'll take it back from them. It was a, it was a, it was a back and forth thing. And then uh, we defend those particular positions. And then that was just before the 38 parallel had moved back from, uh, from the front line because when they signed the armistice, they moved the 38 parallel back from where actually the 38 par parallel was actually originated. Uh, then we moved to a hill we called Jane Russell. Now Jane Russell, we had to uh, defend it twice because we had uh, the enemy over, overran Jane Russell and uh, went all the way back to the Triple Nickel. We call it Triple Nickel, that's the artillery. They ever traded the, the line and went all the way back to where our artillery pieces was and captured 11 guns and almost wiped out this particular outfit. So we had to pull off of that particular hill and go all the way back to the back and start pushing back, pushing up. And uh, we start pushing the enemy back into place. And at the last day on July the 27th, 1953, that's what we were doing. We was in the process of pushing. We were pushing them back in place. And that was the last, so that was the last encounter of combat. And I was up there the last day in the last moments because we stopped firing at 10 minutes to 10, July the 27th, 1953. And we was in the process of pushing them back in place, which we had already got them back in place. But all along the way, it was dead. Dead Chinese, dead Koreans, and dead Americans. Well, we had to pick them up and put them in body bags and throw them in the back of a deuce and has. And that was the last day, July the 27th. Back in Pork Chop Hill, though, tell me about, look, just for a few minutes, about the combat there. Um, the casualties and what you were doing uh, at Pork Chop Hill. The other thing we would do basically during the Pork Chop Hill because see they had already took, uh, Americans had already taken Pork Chop Hill, but we had to defend it. What we do is uh, the enemies attacked us and uh, then we defend the hill. Now, I was, I was just like I was saying, I'm a machine gunner and they're coming waves, they're coming all types of waves. We had barbed wire and minefields and things like that set up, but they would infiltrate that. And uh, sometimes they get all the way up close to the trenches. We was in the trenches at Pocha Hill. And they get all the way up to the trenches, and sometimes we have to just take them to defend and fight it off all kinds of ways. Sometimes you might have hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, but we defended it. We kept it. Uh, we, we always defended it. What was, uh, what was the importance of that hill? It, it wasn't the importance of, well, it was, it was high ground. Any high ground, that's what they wanted, because you got, if you see, in combat, if you've got high ground, you got the advantage of uh, your opponent. And that's what they wanted to uh, get the high ground. To get the high ground, then you can get to pick up some more grounds later on. Uh, they were trying to uh, gain much grounds that they could to the south. Yeah, they were trying to infiltrate much grounds that could and, uh, pertain much ground back to the south, and we were trying to gain much ground we could to the north. And uh, that's what was, that's what that's basically what we were doing uh, at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. The more ground. Now, if they had a, if we had went on like we were supposed to then uh, we wouldn't be in this conflict we're in now. Tell me about freedom. What does freedom mean to you as a veteran and as an American citizen? What does freedom mean to you? Freedom means a whole lot to me as an American citizen. Freedom means that you have freedom of religion to me now because now I'm a Baptist minister. So freedom of religion means a whole lot. Uh, we have freedom to our government, we have freedom to religion, and we have freedom to basically do anything that we want to do in our capacity. And uh, that, that means a whole lot to me. Uh, I, when I was growing up, I, was, I grew up in segregation. And, uh, but we have overcome a lot of that. We have a long ways to go, but we still better off than a lot of those countries that I have been to. Uh, you know, I retired out of the military. I retired as a sergeant major. In a lot of the countries I went to, they didn't have freedom. And it made me feel good that I could go fight for my country and do the things that I did and, and, and the, sac the sacrifices for freedom. And I would do it all over again. Uh, America is the greatest place in the world and, and for what it stands for. But we have to fight for, freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. Uh, you have to do some sacrifices. You have to do some things that continues to uh, achieve freedom. And fighting war sometimes is, is one of them. Uh, I'm ready 
I'm, I'm for age now, but I'm, I'm still willing to go fight for America. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? The American flag means my life. God, which I didn't understand at first, but now God and country. I believe in God, my religion, and I believe in my country and my family. And in that order, God, country, and family. Because sometimes you have to sacrifice family for country and God. And that's what it means to me. In the, in the American flag, when it flies, it symbolizes all those different things, all the freedom that everyone, don't care what nationality, who they are, if they're American, they have certain rights. And people have died for those rights. And that's what it means to me. And when I see it fly, I think about all my comrades and all the people, all the ones before me, my ancestors, and other people's ancestors, all Americans, all the wars, that they have lost lives and limbs, but just for me to be free. And that's what it means to me. Why do you think Korea is, is referred to as the Forgotten War? It's Forgotten War because any time you have a war and that you don't achieve a certain uh, a goal or uh, uh, achievement, then people have a tendency to forget it. Vietnam the same way. Uh, we didn't actually, uh, if we had went on into uh, North Korea and, and like we did Japan and all the other different places, then it wouldn't have been forgotten. But we didn't do that. And in other words, we, uh, we didn't finish what we started to do. And we still, it's still there. But we're not finished it. We still have repercussions from it. You came back and you were a drill instructor? Yes, 14, 14 and a half years old. Did you gain the respect of the recruits? Yes, sir, because I was a, I was a full pledge military combat veteran with the CIB, the combat infantry badge. I received respect. Did you yell at them? Yes, sir, and I knew how to yell. I knew how to yell. Uh, uh, I, as I told you, I was the youngest person that received a CIB, which is a combat infantry badge. In that particular time, you had to be up on the enemy fire for 30 days in the combat zone, up on the enemy fire for 30 days before you'd be a recipient of the combat entry badge. The combat entry badge is worn on your uniform above all medals. And uh, it's a very elite thing for an infantry man to have the combat entry badge. And I'm the youngest person that ever received it. I received it when I was 13 years old. And uh, we used to talk about the drill sergeant when I came back from overseas. Anytime you went to Korea, you come back, you had about three or four months or a year left. Uh, the automatic seemed to a uh, basic training outfit as a platoon sergeant. We do, we, back then, we called them cadre. And so I was a cadre and I enjoyed it. I loved it. Uh, I loved the shine of my boots. I loved my uniform to look neat. And it just gave me prestige and, and gave me honor. Were you training troops to go over to Korea at that time? It was Korean, the Korean conflict was over that particular time, but I was training troops. And then I got out, I stayed out 30 days, and I re-enlisted. Then I went to 82nd Airborne. Then I was a paratrooper. Did you fight in Vietnam? Yes, I was in the 101st. I was where, where in Vietnam? I was in the 101st at uh, Camp Casey. I was up on Highway 101 and uh, a couple more places. But I didn't stay in Vietnam for about six months. Did you see combat in Vietnam? Yes, I've seen a few combats in Vietnam. Did it compare to Korea or was it different? It was different, very different because we were basically fighting in a different uh, terrain. Uh, the terrain there was basically rice paddies and villages and, and then again, basically you didn't know basically who you were fighting. The same people that are, uh, you, you fight tonight might be the, the form of tomorrow. So it was very difficult. And then uh, I got out. And I went back and enlisted in the National Guard and further my education. I finished high school and uh, went in the National Guard. I went in the National Guard as an E-4. And uh, I retired as a Sergeant Major, the first black Sergeant Major. Well, uh, Norman, I just 
12 years of age, going into the Army, I mean, uh, it, it's a part of your life. You did this thing, and you, I think 18 years old is, or 17 is young for somebody, mm -hmm. but at your age, um, how, why were you successful in what you did at that young age? Uh, I'm glad you asked. God. I believe in God, and uh, I believe in a higher force, and uh, I, I have to believe it because now I'm a Baptist minister, a Dane Baptist minister. The, the angels were watching over me. Uh, they, they watched over me, and, and right now I, I dedicate everything to God because without Him, there's no way I could have went all through all the different conflicts and all the different trials and tribulations if somebody or something, a, a spiritual force wasn't guiding me and protecting me, and He did. And, uh, and that's why I'm a Baptist minister now, because I'm dedicating everything back to uh, the back to God. Uh, it's not that I was so great, and uh, it's something I did to get through this. God brought me through, just like He did David and and and, and some of the other biblical people. He did me the same way, and so now I give back to Him that He may get the glory, and, and that's that's why I'm a Baptist preacher. The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. Why do you think you survived and others didn't, maybe with the same beliefs that you had that they were killed? Uh, God, it, it, it's, it's for him to get the glory. Uh, and I don't question what he do. He does things to make so other people can profit from him. So other people can say, well, if he can do this say at 12 years old, then you can do the same thing. And uh, sometimes people have to sacrifice even in life, for the will of God. And we don't know what the will of God is. So the only thing we do is do the best we can and, and do what we think is right and, and, and follow through with that. Uh, the will of God is, is not our will. So we don't question why did this person, this happened to this person or, and didn't happen to that person. And I have felt guilty about certain things because I know some of the people that uh, I was uh, uh, close to and some of the people I'm close to now, and I didn't come back. And they live good lives, and they're good people. But some, some things happen to them, and some of the poor people that do all kinds of different things don't happen to them. But it's not for us to question. It's, the best, it's for us to do the best we can in, in life and treat people like we want to be treated. And, and so God will get the glory, not us. It's not about us. Because at the end, all of us are meaningless anyway. Uh, we, we strive to, uh, for another kingdom. And uh, I, I did like the war. Uh, I, I went through the war at 13 years old. I went to the war of segregation. Now I'm going through the war of Christianity. I'm a Baptist minister. But it's not for me to say what's right and what's wrong and who's right and who's wrong. It's best for me to do the will of God, which he called me to do, is try to get souls to what well, we won't have to have no wars. If people believe in, in the Lord and, and they believe in uh, doing what's right and treating people as they want to be treated in the love of God, then we won't have no wars. But until then, we're going to have a war. And uh, if we're going to have a war, then we have to defend ourselves. Well said. Um, we're getting near the end of the interview, but I want you to go back in time and remember when you were 12, 13 years old, did you ever think you would ever shoot anybody? And then tell me the first time you were, you had to shoot somebody, what your thoughts were. I, I never dreamed uh, that I would have to uh, shoot someone. But the environment that I was raised up in and the side of town that I was raised up in, Every Friday and Saturday night, somebody got cut a shot. So it was, my surroundings was there. <laughs> I didn't ever dream that I'd be doing it. So uh, when I went into combat, by me being raised up in that surrounding, I, I guess it's what it's hard to do. So that goes back to certain things that we exposed to will bring, out, bring certain things out of us. Uh, if you're exposed to violence on TV and, and violence in the street, then it's easy for violence to come out of us because we're human. So I was raised up in a violent neighborhood. 
So it was easy for violence to come out of me. So the best thing we can do now is try to keep violence out of our neighborhood and violence out of our homes and violence out of our environment. And then we just want the violence won't be enough. But the the main thing that you were talking about shooting a person, it was for survival. Uh, the average person that kill somebody or shoot somebody, if somebody invading your home or something, you don't want to actually kill that person, but you think that your life is in, in danger, then you react. And so what I was doing was reacting. I was reacting. Just like you throw a person over into some water. The first thing, if they can swim or not, the first thing they're gonna do is try to swim. So you have to react. So now if somebody's shooting at you, you know they're gonna kill you, you say, oh, they're trying to kill me. You're gonna react. If I come up and hit you or smack you, you know that I mean business, I'm finna fight you. So you have to go into the fighting mood. You got two moves you go into. You go into the move of fleeing or fighting. So if you don't run, you have to fight. And so it's just, it's just a human, it's your human nature. Just like an animal or anything else. You either run or you fight. You said you had a machine gun. What kind of machine gun? I had a 30 caliber machine gun. I started off with a 30 caliber air cool. And then on I, a tripod or did you Yeah, both of them was on a tripod. I went to John, John Wayne. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was 30 caliber air cool. And then I went to the 30 caliber water cool. The water, water cool is kind of like, like a little tank on, on, around the barrel. Uh, but both of them basically the same thing. On one is air cool, and one is, which actually air cool is a little bit lighter than the, uh, the water cool. Did you ever think about how many Chinese you might have killed, or is that something that you don't need to think about? No, I don't have to think about it because uh, I dream it most every night. I have nightmares uh, from post-traumatic stress, and uh, I, I, I don't want to, uh, but every now and then it, it pops up. And it mostly pop up in when we have climate raw weather, like rain, when it starts raining, get climate weather and stuff like this, uh, that's when I have most of my problems. Mm -hmm. It reminds you of Korea. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of Korea. So you've suffered with post-traumatic stress then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Boy. I, at one time I was suffering from post-traumatic stress to the extreme where I couldn't even hold a job. I, was very, I became very, very violent. Uh, I was short-tempered. And, uh, and the only thing, I had therapy. I talked to the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that did me any good is when I went to the Bible. And I went to the Bible, and uh, then I ended up being a Baptist minister. Yeah, that's <laughs> so that's the only thing that uh, uh, brought me out of it. Yeah. Well, I got relief. Are you proud that you're a Korea War veteran? I'm proud to be a veteran. I'm just proud to be an American. And I don't want anybody to do anything that I won't do. Uh, I have rights, I have privileges, and I want to take the responsibility uh, having those rights and those privileges. And so being a war veteran, to keep those privileges, then I'm ready to go. Yeah. People thank you for your service? Well, people thank me for my service that know what freedom is. See, you have some people that take things for granted. And uh, a person take things for granted, they don't care about my service or your service or anybody else's service. But the ones that actually that had people in their family and people that have served themselves and know what acts where freedom is. The first thing, to, to, to recognize what freedom is, you must have some hardships. You have to go through some things sometime before you actually know what freedom is and what freedom is. So I have been through hardships. I have seen certain things. I have seen other countries. I have seen what other people have went through. And I have seen what we have went through right here in America. So I understand what freedom is. So ever what I need to do to gain and keep freedom, I'm willing to do it. And that's the way we have to feel as America. This is America. Uh, we about to, when I hear the, the Star Spatter Battle, when I hear it playing, that music playing, and, and seeing that flag waving, uh, it just do something to me, it just make me say, I'm ready to go. I'm re I want to go. I want, I want to do my part again. Yeah. So that's the, that's the spirit in me. Uh, I am a veteran. I am a combat veteran, and I'm proud to be one, and I always will be one. I start off, I, I was raised in the Army. I was raised in the military. I was raised in the military. That's why I have military courtesy. I know about military courtesy. I don't have no problem getting along with people 
because I was raised in the Army. The Army raised me, and I'm glad. And I thank you for the military. And like uh, all in all say, uh, some of the things the president do, uh, some of the things he say, I don't agree with. But I'm thankful for him because he's my commander in chief. And if he tell me to do something, I go stand in the corner. He tell me to go stand in the corner. I say, how long, Mr. President? And thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the attitude. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah you bet. You bet. Boy, I'm amazed with your story. Um, I'm going to, I think I'm about done with the interview. We may chat a little bit more, but I, mm -hmm. I do want to see what we can do about writing a book. I can't believe nothing's mm -hmm. been written yet. I mean. Well, you know why. Well, yeah, but I mean, but but, but 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 it wasn't a particular time for it to be. It's a time for it now. Yeah, I agree. Now you you and I are gonna do something about it, and we're gonna do more. We can do more than that about it. Not just because we're gonna get rewarded for it, but because other people need to know. They do. Yeah, and why not know it? File in. How you pronounce your last name? Capetto. Capetto. Larry what, Capetto. What, 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 what? Okay, why Larry know it can't let it be known? Larry Larry had a very knowledge of. Uh, yeah, your filming and all that stuff. He he know he have contacts, and Noah got the story. So why Noah, well Larry Noah can't do it? Yeah, and I'm not and Noah not asking Larry for no money. I call some some of the things I can help finance myself. See what I'm saying? So we do it. This doesn't matter. We getting together and putting it together, getting it together, and contacting the right person. And we are gonna contact the right person because the right person, uh, God gonna show us the right person. Like I. I agree, man. I'm yeah. a believer. My brother pastors a church. Yeah. yeah. So, I, well, you think this just happened? This just didn't happen. You no, come to no. you come to Colorado to Spartanburg and and me and you getting together and come coming to come come. That just didn't happen. That didn't happen for a reason. At this particular time, not ten years ago, twenty years ago, but now. This this is the time. That's how you got to think. Yeah, it's, and you've got a wonderful story and, and just serving in combat, what you experience in combat, losing your friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you do lose friends. Yeah. People you knew and. Uh, but at the time, was it real to you, or was it later that you mourned their death? Uh, 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 well, at the time, it was kind of like a, 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 a dream. This is not happening. You know, what, what is this? You know, is this? And then the reason I felt that way because I was so far away from home. See, you're not on, are you? Yeah, we're on. Oh, we still on? Yeah. Oh, okay. You want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, it's just like uh, you put a person, an animal, in a cage. Uh, uh, you go back to slavery. Yeah, you, you, you put a person in a certain situation, it's certain things that are ways he will react. Uh, just like you deprive a person from sleep for over a period of time, he gonna react a certain way. Uh, if you keep food away from him from a certain length of time, he gonna react, react a certain different way. And so it's like a, a come back to anything else. If you put a person in a certain situation, certain things will come out of it. If you take an animal and hem him up, if you take, take a cat and put hem him up in a corner, the cat might go around your leg all day long and not bother you. But if you hem him up in a corner uh, where he knows that you might attack him uh, uh, for survival, then you'd be surprised what that cat might do. So it's just like we human. Uh, you can take a, you don't have to be 12 years old. You can take a person eight years old, and you put them in a certain situation, and uh, they they react a certain way because they're human. I'm going to have you do one more thing on camera before I shut it off. From where you're seated, at the end of my interviews, I always ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated. When I tell you, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sir. Right into the camera. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Stay right there. Yes, sir. I'm going to take a picture of